Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our Q3 China update, which will be the last one of the year. Um, thank you for joining us on a, on a Monday morning, and I hope that we can bring some fantastic insights to you what's been happening in developments in China over the last quarter. Um, the China business has been around since 2012, um, with our feeder fund with having an eight and a half year track record um, that is run by Liang and his team based out of Shanghai in China. Joining us on the call as well today is Tian, who's Head of Product Development for the Press in China team. Um, and then what we'll be focusing on today is kind of what evolution or, or, or changes we've seen in China over the last quarter is what's coming through in the education policy. Um, obviously, it's very topical right now, the last few weeks, what's happening with the whole Evergrades property. Um, and then just looking at kind of how the ongoing relationships between the US and China ha have grown. Um, and then looking kind of at a valuation, a bit of a metrics, how we, we look at certain stocks, calling them labeling the mania stocks. And then lastly, just the current positioning of where the press in China fund sits and positioning the fund going forward. So please make use of the Q&A functionality so you can ask those questions to Tian and Liang that we'll get through to the end. And along with that, we'll be doing running a few, few polls throughout the session. Um, so please just answer those for us and then we'll give you some feedback on them at the end of the session. Over to you, Liang, Liang and Tian. Thanks very much, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us uh, this morning, I think. Uh, for, for those of you that have joined us previously for our webinars, you'll notice that we, we've changed background. So we moved into our new offices this past quarter. Quite a lot of changes as the Press in China team expands. Uh, but yeah, glad to be joining you guys from our new office and uh, hoping to provide a much better update this time, this quarter. So firstly, I think as we've done over the past many quarters, COVID-19 update, uh, we see the map is getting a lot, lot greener uh, with a lot more vaccines being administered. China getting to that 80% mark, uh, the country is still taking, taking very much a zero tolerance approach to COVID, which is why its borders are still as shut as it has been over the past 18 months or so. Uh, the rest of the world is starting to open up and we are seeing economic activity return. Uh, we are hoping for Chinese borders to open up uh, gradually next year, many rumors floating around, but currently no clear date in, in sight. Uh, but either way, a positive, uh, positive trend, as you can see from the chart on the right hand side, uh, China right at the top uh, in terms of vaccine administration rates. Moving on to China and US relations, I think uh, this is where uh, what we call over the past quarter a great leap forward in terms of bilateral relations. I think. Uh, what's made the headlines end of September, just before the Chinese national holiday uh, celebrations, the release of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. She's been in detention in Canada uh, for extradition requests uh, from the US since December 2018. So over a thousand days uh, living in Canada, fighting her extradition charges. Uh, we've uh, sort of uh, viewed this as a political incident uh, since the beginning. Uh, and finally, the US prosecutors uh, dropped or effectively dropped the charges on a deferred prosecution agreement, uh, which is then expected to be dismissed uh, by the end of next year um, if uh, the two, both parties don't don't breach agree an agreement reached on this DPA. Uh, so one of the key key points is that there was no admission of guilt uh, from May, and uh, however there was admission of wrongdoing. So some, some sort of a resolution where both sides could, could get away saving face uh, while leading to warmer China and US relations. So from a political perspective, we viewed this as a significant sign of goodwill from the American side. And that uh, has been well received uh, on the Chinese side. And we expect to see a lot of sort of concrete steps towards warmer relations and more cooperation on both sides. Um, we almost immediately saw sign, signs of warming, or not signs, actual steps of warming relations. Uh, so during, during a speech at the CSIS, Catherine Tai, uh, very recently, so in early October, shortly after the release of uh, Meng Wanzhou, uh, mentioned that uh, there will be, the US will unilaterally announce certain tariff exemptions. And those tariff, tariff exemptions do not have exact details yet, but American companies can apply uh, for, spe for specific goods to be exempt uh, from the tariffs 
put on uh, since the Trump era. Uh, so we see that as a major, major sign, uh, a major positive sign. Uh, obviously, Catherine Tai also spoke to Chief Chinese Trade Negotiator Liu He uh, for the second time since May in early October as, um, as relations have warmed. So again, uh, the unilateral announcement of tariff exemptions we believe very much for U.S. interest, but again, another sign of goodwill from the U.S., uh, which will benefit bilateral relations and also be benefit domestic U.S. inflation expectations, which has come under pressure uh, lately. So other developments on, on both sides, I think we've always been saying that uh, China and U.S. relations have been very icy uh, since the Trump days. and there was always very little room for further deterioration and, and much easier to improve relations. So other positive steps we saw was that Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi met US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Switzerland for, for sort of face-to-face -face talks. Um, after the release of MAV, China has agreed to allow Gina Raimondo, the Commerce Secretary of America, to lead an American business delegation to visit China. The final date is still to be confirmed. And also uh, there's uh, been so, some sort of a, a, an agreement where President Xi Jinping and uh, Joe Biden will be expected to meet via virtual conference later this year. And we await uh, those uh, positive news, the details of the positive news uh, with uh, much eagerness. Um, so I think overall what we've been reading uh, in the conventional Western media tone on China is still negative, and we maintain our views that we need to uh, still focus on filtering out sensational noise uh, from conventional media and focus on actual events and hard data. Uh, but overall, we do see uh, sort of clear evidence uh, that tensions are beginning to ease, and we are hoping for further positive development between China and the US, and which will then be um, you know, positive for markets and positive for humanity. Uh, as a whole, we believe. Okay, on to the educare sector, which made massive headlines uh, back in July, which seems uh, you know, an age ago. Um, significant reform, but I think I wanted to take everyone through some typical Asian stereotypes. Um, um, so these memes was what, what I saw growing up uh, at school, uh, the sort of the stereotype of Asian students studying hard, good at math, etc. And uh, it's actually, uh, there's quite a lot of difficult and sad truth behind these memes. Uh, so 92% of surveyed parents in China uh, say that they send their children to extracurricular uh, classes. Uh, this is a survey done in Beijing. So basically, as, as hard as Chinese schooling system already is, kids still, 92% of children, um, still go to go to extracurricular classes uh, to try and get their marks even higher, and the remaining eight percent that go, don't go, we suspect, is probably due to financial affordability uh, reasons. Um, let me take you take everyone through a typical day of a preschool child in Shanghai. Shanghai is a tier one city; it's where our president offices are based in Shanghai. Um, so typically, uh, a preschool child wakes up about seven a.m. Uh, goes to school, preschool, uh, from between 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, after 3 p.m., there's typically a break uh, of between 3 and 5.30, obviously, including travel time from preschool back home, uh, typically with the care of grandparents, as both parents are working uh, due to the financial pressures of surviving in a tier one city in China. Uh, extra lessons, uh, typically math, Chinese, English, or music, uh, from about 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and then this happens for at least three to four weekdays during the week. So out of five days, three to four days, and then over the weekend, at least one day of extra lessons or extracurricular activities. Um, this sounds extremely busy to us at the office uh, coming with a South African mindset. And the scary part is it's, a, it's for a preschool child. And we think this is part of the reason why the government has, here has really clamped down on, on after-school education. So to give some more detail uh, on sort of the high-level regulation that has been released um, is that after-school tutoring services will be severely restricted. Uh, so foreign capital invested into an industry will be bought through M&A and VIE structures. Uh, 
existing structures still remain however. So going forward, we expect listings of such structures uh, to be severely restricted, are uh, probably not possible going forward. Um, after school training companies banned from providing overseas education classes. This is uh, seen sort of more as a, a patriotic group and also lessening the study burden on local kids still having to study through local school curriculum, but we still await detailed uh, sort of, uh, you know, re detailed regulation and implementation steps on these sort of uh, high level regulations. Uh, what's uh, the most significant step uh, that effectively killed the industry in its current form is that school subject tutoring uh, currently has to, has to be transformed into non-profit organizations. So, and then also no school tutoring on weekends, public holidays, and all classes to end before 9 p.m. Uh, so the restriction is to end before 9 p.m. So that gives one an idea of how late uh, children study till uh, in China if they have to put down a restriction of 9 p.m. And all of this is targeted at K-9 school programs or below. So typically your children age 15 and below. High school subject training currently still not affected uh, because high school study is very intense for college entrance exams, et cetera. So uh, yeah, all of this very much affecting the 15 year and under uh, population group, which we feel is fairly healthy. And we'll go through that on the next slide. But uh, all of this still high level re regulation. There is more detailed regulation and direction being uh, given out uh, all the time. Uh, and we expect it to be at least another six to 12 months before we have some, some very uh, further clarity on where the industry is heading. Um, in terms of uh, the logic uh, behind, behind the regulation, we we believe it is aimed at uh, sort of regulating the exploitation of children and parents. So, so there's a lot of stress on young families um, to, to afford, uh, to be able to pay for a lot of the expensive things in tier one cities, for example. Uh, but uh, I think overall the government wants a healthier lifestyle for children in general. The government uh, sort of released a, a new sort of birth policy allowing a third child uh, to be had in China. I think uh, many of you will remember the one child policy. It was uh, relaxed to a two child policy and now uh, you're allowed to have three children uh, per family. The problem is affordability issues um, are restricting, especially tier one and tier two city families on having uh, even one child often. So it's definitely the move to encourage higher birth rates and uh, in line with the common prosperity sort of goal uh, to promote more equal educational re resources so that not only your wealthiest families that can afford the best off the school education lessons can get into the top universities. Uh, so government trying to push through a more level level playing field. Whether they will be successful remains to be seen. Uh, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to take at least six to 12 months, we believe, for, for more, more clarity. So in terms of sort of the claims of um, certain sensational media headlines to say uh, it was a very sudden, unexpected move from government, we definitely believe it wasn't. Uh, there was very strong government message since at least March 2021. So there were official announcements uh, that the government released after the NPC meetings to say they wanted to tackle the after school education sector. There were multiple rounds of meetings with the top education firms. So, for example, TAL Education and New Oriental uh, would have been expected to be part of the meetings. Uh, so firms knew at least weeks before the official announcement. Obviously, the exact detail, we don't believe uh, many people knew, but uh, there were definitely risks to be managed uh, prior to the announcement. So thankfully, I think uh, we did mention in a note that we put out that uh, President uh, did not have much exposure to, to the sector, uh, largely due to the crazy valuations of the companies. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, we, we wait and see uh, to see how the off school educate sector situation will turn out in the next six to 12 months. So moving on to Evergrande and the Chinese property sector. I think this is a chart uh, of but the, the orange line is Evergrande, a selective uh, 2015 CNY Evergrande bond, so local Chinese yuan denominated bond. Uh, and the green line is Evergrande stock price movement. Uh, so you can see that a crash in both of the pricing uh, towards uh, the third quarter of 2021. 
A lot of questions have been asked, uh, but uh, we believe, firstly, I think uh, this is unlikely to be China's Lima moment, even though we, uh, we um, really view this as the first real test uh, for Chinese properties on a large scale. Uh, Chinese properties have been uh, growing extremely fast uh, and providing tremendous return for investors over the past couple of decades. Uh, this is the first real test. Um, companies like Evergrande have gone on a really a, a, a debt craze, uh, although the Chinese government saw this uh, quite a few years ago and large banks have mostly avoided Evergrande debt since about 2018. Um, we don't believe the Evergrande, cra what the Evergrande situations will get out of control and crash uh, in an uncontrolled manner because the Chinese regulators are extremely competent in our experience and they are efficient in managing such situations. Large banks have exited uh, Evergrande debt, so we don't believe there will be a systemic issue in the Chinese financial system. And the central bank, PBOC, is, has been providing sufficient liquidity to ensure the financial system is steady in China. In terms of uh, Evergrande specifically, uh, we expect equity uh, value to go down to zero. So, uh, trading of its equity in Hong Kong has already been suspended. And we feel the bonds uh, are attractive if the discount to par is 75% or more. So the base case is about 25 cents to the yuan on, on valuation. If it drops significantly below that, uh, we might find attractiveness in get, taking certain positions. Uh, but right now, we believe overall it will be sort of an orderly dissolution process. Uh, for the Evergrande group. Uh, some more detail, Evergrande still has over 1 trillion CNY of inventory that needs to be sold and delivered. A significant portion still needs to be completed. So the regulator, we expect, will ensure that the most vulnerable of the stakeholders are protected. So directing um, a sort of priority to cash flow to completing homes so that home buyers and suppliers for Evergrande will be protected because a lot of the debt uh, is in advanced purchases and sort of unpaid supplier payments uh, in the Evergrande sort of debt structure. We believe Evergrande has kicked off uh, negative sentiment towards the property sector. For example, a uh, tier one city like Shanghai, at least secondhand or secondary market property transactions have dropped close to 90% uh, since the beginning of the year, uh, if we look at September data. So we believe it will affect consumption uh, in the short term. The majority of Chinese family wealth is in property values, at almost 70% of household wealth. Um, mm -hmm. But we do believe if it's managed well, the entire situation of, of the property sector uh, will create more long-term disposable income. If properties uh, become more affordable uh, over the long term, uh, it will be positive for the economy uh, going forward, even though there will be short-term pain. Okay, so I think with that, I'm going to pass over to Leah. I'm going to take us through some market valuation and pricing position. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I think, look, zooming out a little bit, our starting point is actually the Chinese market overall is reasonably valued. So, P ratios as of September 2021, China is about 16.6. Hong Kong, specifically China shares lifted in Hong Kong, is about 10.3. Um, so we think that this is quite attractive. It's actually, in terms of the Hong Kong, Chinese stock system in Hong Kong, this is the cheapest we've pretty much ever seen in all of history. And China, relative to the rest of emerging Asia, also looks extremely attractive. And when compared to the US and US NASDAQ, it's very, very cheap. So there's valuations on an overall level from the top. There's not much issues. The index itself is okay. Right, give me in a little bit more detail. Um, if you look at a bit of the history, although cheap relative to peers and cheap relative to the US, for example, it is uh, towards a neutral or slightly higher end of the China itself. So in 2006 and 2007 and 2010, massive stimulus pulled uh, Chinese equity markets to crazy levels. But currently, it's no longer the depressed or cheap levels we had multiple times in, such as 2013 or after the 2015 correction, um, but it's not too expensive. Um, so that's where we're sitting, more or less neutral uh, relative to its own history and cheap relative to its peers. All right, in terms of global valuation, I think, so there's just something I want to point out. So back in 2002, the IT bubble, um, so the Oracle System CEO kind of made this famous quote, and he's just saying his company at the time has a price to sell ratio of 10 plus, right? And he says, for you to justify a price to sales of 10, 
is that for 10 years, a company has to pay back 100% of the revenue and dividends, zero cost of sales, zero expenses, zero taxes, zero R&D for 10 all years to get more price of sales of 10 to justify stock. So as great as CEO he is, his point was it was absolutely crazy. So a price of sales of 10 is kind of a really, really crazy level of valuation. So today, uh, as you said in 2020, in, end of June, uh, Kailash Capital did this chart, and basically it's 4.5 trillion of total market cap with price of sales greater than 20 in the United States. So price of sales of 20 are the S&P. And that's how crazy it is. So since the year 2000, we haven't seen a bubble as large. Uh, people are honestly, because of low interest rates, because of global low interest rates, have honestly boosted valuations of, of different companies with absolute crazy levels. If you look at China, it's not nearly as bad, but still bad. So in terms of China, Asia's percentage of bids on the price of sales of 10, you can see that you know, we're lower than what we see the 2005 bubble, 2010 bubble, 2015 bubble. So currently we're nowhere near. We're about 15% of Asia's are at those levels, uh, whereas previously it's about 20%. In terms of market cap, though, that's a little bit high, around 25% of the market cap is actually that high. So early on, as I mentioned, the index as a whole is not that expensive, but there are portions of the Chinese Asian market to do with consumption, with different themes that are extremely hot and we believe are extremely dangerous. And I think the problem with very, very high valuation, so often we get the query, well, what if interest rates stay low forever? You know, that mean, you know, market just keep going and going and going. We know that's not true. So in, in the Japan, for example, in the 1990s, market was a huge bubble, Japanese interest rates went down to zero and stayed low forever. And in spite of being low forever, the market took almost 30 years to recover. So I just want to remind everyone that on crazy valuations, even if interest rates stay low forever, well, the history we do have still tells you that you need to be a little bit careful. Right, and what do you need to be careful of in the Chinese market? You know, about 69 months ago, we started talking about mainly stocks. And mainly stocks, how we defined it, was things that had almost 100% return the last 12 months greater than 100 billion in market cap. So we're not talking about a small company that can grow to be very large. We're talking about the huge company. We're talking about PE ratios on average, 50 to 300 times and price to sales of 10 times plus. Um, so this type of stuff is what you need to watch out for here in China. And we made a list back in 2021, you know, all these companies that come out and they're some of the most popular stocks you will have in China. And what we've also been telling clients is that a lot of active managers all together Everyone, three dollar stocks in China, all active managers, or 90% of them, put the money into the same 70 stocks, which are all great companies, but with valuations that are just absolutely crazy. And the end result is that since, uh, since about February, they've crashed massively. So, so typically they've been falling 30 to 40 percent, and some of them even 50 and 60 percent since so February 2021. And uh, what we're glad to say in terms of our positioning is that we've avoided it. So we've always said, look, we do want to chase these irrational markets. We know why valuations are crazy, but low interest rates, but even then it's quite crazy. And the end result is that our alpha is about three and a half percent in our months. In the last nine months, alpha is three and a half percent. And here today, our sign is basically flat. So our equities are down zero percent. It hasn't moved at all. So it's not something that everyone, often our clients get very worried. They call us up and say, gee, it's all these things happening. It's trying to down massively. The answer is no. So the market's been reasonably flat. So after two fantastic years, the last two years, uh, the Chinese market is a little bit more quiet uh, currently, and we believe that our approach of being more diversified um, will be a helpful approach uh, going forward. Or if an alpha approach kind of seems to be the right approach going forward. Right, in terms of sectors, once again, um, we're not too, you know, we never take huge sector bets uh, because we don't believe in that. Um, we know some things can be the best sectors in the world, others are. They're not so great, very hard to predict, so we don't do that. But there's some common themes you can see. And one of the themes is that we tend to be slightly underweight consumers and slightly overweight financials. And there's actually two big reasons for that. Number one, as mentioned earlier, um, you know, Hong Kong market has been kind of cheapest in Asia and Hong Kong has been cheapest in all of history. And they have a lot of financials there. So you're buying top tier banks and brokers at P's of 67, the mean yield of 89, right? And for all those people who fear that the Chinese uh, property market is going to collapse,
just by understanding. The second thing we look at is it's when we compare to the ETF, for example. For the past year, we outperformed the biggest year by 300 ETF by over 7%, and annualized, we're outperforming the biggest ETF by about 5%. So for those clients who want exposure to China, um, you know, instead of buying an ETF, I'll find will be a perfect one for one solution uh, that really helps you outperform over time. Uh, in terms of asset allocation, we've always been very, very active. And you can see that on run June and July, we've been down at about 48 to 50% equity. And that comes from the fact that in our models, sentiment is a little bit weak in China at the moment. Our economics models are very, very clear that growth is slowing down. And at the same time, policy hasn't yet been as supportive as it can be. Um, what this means is that it gives a lot of firepower when we see the valuation gets either cheaper, we'll be up in our equities materially, or vice versa, with everything that's going on in the economy. If we see that um, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, policymakers will start reducing stimulus, at the same time, we will up our allocation. Um, in times when global valuations are at all time high, in times when Chinese valuations is not as cheap as it was historically, um, you know, just going, you know, full blast, 100% equities, we think is, is not a, you know, it's, it's a risky approach. Uh, where Finally, our approach, um, our approach of being more diversified relative to our competitors means that over three year and five year longer term time horizons, here in the China dynamic asset allocation category with over 4,000 funds, we're looking at being the top 2% in the last three years, top 4% in the last five years, and about the top 1% since we started with the fund. We continue to believe that approach is the right way to go. Right, so to conclude, valuation is very elevated around the world. And China is reasonable by comparison. Um, but even then, you know, valuations are not so attractive that you're looking at huge um, you know, real returns. I think over the next cycle, if you can get to inflation plus 46, uh, we are current valuation and current market conditions, it'll be quite good to be quite attractive. For us, it's crucial not to chase a fad in the main stocks. I think no one can predict when to turn. More often than not, all these fads and stocks have a very good reason to be hot. Uh, but just have to be careful and, and never you know, throw out cautious caution. Um, you know, when variation gets absolutely crazy, a crash will come very, very quickly. No one can predict it. You have to get caught up in an approach of being more rational, diversified, systematic, and consistent. Means that over the cycle, we'll be top four. And we'll continue to do that. And finally, I think with the flexible asset allocation balance fund, it means that we have a lot of firepower to deploy if and when valuation becomes more attractive in China or policy becomes more supportive. So we think flexibility is a very good approach to these challenging times. So I'm going to stop there and open up the, um, for questions. Great, thank you very much, Tiana Liang. Um, and there are quite a few questions coming through. Um, and I'm maybe just going to start with, with something um, that I saw this morning. So maybe just looking at China's Q3 GDP numbers, um, I think they came through slightly weaker at about 4.9 as opposed to the expected 5%. Do you think this is from a global supply chain issue or is it a China-specific thing? Are we going to start seeing this more and more globally um, that these expected returns are probably going to undershoot or undershoot a little bit? And then maybe a second one stem of that, probably more of a positive side of the GDP numbers that retail and jobs numbers came through quite strong. Um, do you think that means that the sentiment on the ground is sort of changing a bit as well? So I think let's start with the first part, I think. Um, China has always been the entire COVID um, cycle. China's been ahead of the rest of the world by about three to six months. So about three to six months. The COVID rebound is over, I think. Um, so that's what the data in China is telling us. So I think the most, most, most clear thing that you can see on the data is that the COVID rebound, which is based on nothing, let's be honest, people don't get more productive during COVID. Uh, it's just a matter of low interest rates, lots of stimulus over the short term that racked up a lot of debt. Um, so that's over, and that's what you see in China. Right. So luckily for China, that during COVID, we can have a huge stimulus program. Uh, so there's a lot of firepower on the government policy side. And similarly, I think this is just a natural slowdown um, that's going to happen with the COVID stimulus being over. 
At the same time, we come through a little bit of, of uh, you know, Evergrande slowing down the property market and all of that. And on top of that, we have a situation where China was growing above COVID levels, above their trend growth for what, which government had been seeing since the start of the year. So if you recall at the start of the year, everyone says China's growing at nine, and Chinese government says, look, if we get above six, we're happy, right? And I think that's more or less what they're seeing, is that it's understanding that you cannot stimulate your way to real growth. Uh, you know, that's what we see. So the GDP number I think that you're seeing is, is very, very timely, and I think it's something to expect for the rest of the world. If you extend that out, I think what it means for the rest of the world is, of course, a bit scarier, especially where valuations are in the rest of the world. Um, I think in terms of um, growth, retail sales and everything, yeah, it's looking at okay. it. China's you know, it's still early and maybe early or in the mid stage of the consumption side. Services are not always going to grow more than production in the foreseeable future. Um, so I think that's going to happen anyway. Um, so that those things are to be expected. Great, thank you. And then um, obviously quite a bit of comment about the whole Evergrade saga. Um, and may maybe if you can just, you know, are, is there going to be government intervention? Um, you know, how many incomplete projects are floating around in the market at the moment? Um, you know, and, and, you know, maybe just go into that a little bit further if you can. Sure. Um, so as mentioned, Evergrade is the biggest Chinese developer, but uh, the biggest junk bond issue uh, uh, out of China. Right, so I see one other question was, you know, banks have ex exited, so who's holding it, who will bear the price? Um, so, so one's very, very clear that even two, three years ago, Evergrande was raising money overseas in dollars for 8 to 16% from hedge funds, right? And the story we keep hearing overseas, or we're touring overseas, is these guys tell us, oh no, Evergrande's too big to fail, but you buy it and you, you make a lot of money. And we always say, ah, you know, you need to be very careful about it, you need to be very careful about it. So uh, the first question is, if you bought dollar, Evergrande bonds, often over layers through four different entities overseas with a whole bunch of complex agreements. I think you're going to be in trouble. Let's be frank, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. Right? So that's going to be, uh, you, you are immediately in trouble. So that's true to be the front. Number two, what Evergrande has done is since the banks cut off their access to capital, they've been paying their suppliers later and later. So they've been suppliers one because of price. Pay up later, and then they did shadow banking, raised uh, money through shadow banking, artificial sources. So all of that has to be cleared up. So what the government, what's most likely going to happen is the government understands you cannot have the systematic risk of this block. So number one, the banks are already safe, they have to worry about that. And number two, what they're going to do is an orderly breakup. Uh, so the land is valuable. So the land itself in China is valuable. Half completed project needs to be completed. Uh, so they're going to break every ground up. An auction of pieces to different developers to take over. So we already see that other developers will take over projects, blow it up, and start to get uh, on those things and make sure that those houses are developed, everything done. What it does mean for us is that I think uh, properties have gone on for decades in China. And affordability of property is a problem. And it's been a problem for years. And something since about 2016, governments realized this problem since about 2018, 2019, governments been on top of it. So I think. To, to zoom out and tell you guys very, very, very simple. It's a simple, simple thing. The property market in China can only grow slower than income growth over the next decade, decade and a half. That's going to be the clear outcome. So if you do buy property companies or you do buy that, or we prefer bonds or the equity, just make sure that that is part of your core thesis. Okay? It's possible you may have a spike in the short term. Over the next 10, 15 years, what is very, very clear and what the government's going towards is that you're going to have property prices rise slower than income to improve affordability over the next 10 to 15 years. And that's what you have to, um, and that's what to be expected and something to look at. So I think that's more or less everywhere. I think if you're expecting massive collapse of property markets and big defaults at the end of China, once again, I think that's, well, that doesn't happen. But don't worry about that. Um, what's more likely to happen as I mentioned is, is a changing model in the longer term. And it is actually a crucial change. So the last thing you want is consumers paying 20 years or 30 years or 40 years of an income on a dead property that has no economic output. Right? You want them to spend their money on something that can grow. So China's been focusing a lot on upping the value chain instead of making cheaper stuff, making more useful, better quality, higher stuff. And that's where this model is this going to define China for the next 10 years. They shift away from this property and make them quick money. That's over and going to the next phase of Chinese growth. 
Great, thank you. Um, and I'm just going to you know, look back at one of the polls here. So you know, we're looking at you know, does is China still a viable investment opportunity? And you know, almost almost fifty percent saying yes, but you know, one of a few things to settle. Um, and maybe looping it to one of the questions we've had as well is that when you invest in China, are you looking at it at like a emerging market country, or are you looking at a developed market? Um, and you know, I suppose if it is viewed as an emerging market, well, then you need to be able to take on some of that risk with it. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Well, I think China is very interesting. I think it's one of it's not a typical emerging market. It doesn't produce commodities. It imports commodities and exports finished goods. It's one of the biggest economies in the world, but it is still a closed economy. So it has closed capital accounts. It doesn't have freedom of capital movement. So I would say it's a bit of a hybrid. I think on the one hand, there's certain things that need to develop better and better. And on the other hand, I think China has a lot of positives that other people don't see. And that from that is you know, very competent policy making, very long term decision making, and actually a workforce that is just unbelievably productive. I think that's a crucial thing. That you have a well educated workforce that is very, very productive, that still hasn't employed all the capital that could be employed to get them to have their startup. So I think that would make China attractive to us. And I think ultimately, what's also good is it, it always comes with a healthy dose of skeptical. So we've always said you must always buy China when everyone says China's about to collapse, and you should always um, sell China when everyone says China is the best in the world. And I think that remains true to this day. So I think you know, we are hoping that with Ayla Grant, of course, people will once again go, oh, you know, um, you, uh, you know, China's going to collapse soon. Uh, so then it'd be a great opportunity to start buying China again. Great, and then and, and this is probably a hard question to put to put to you. Um, you know, but, you know, people are saying now, well, you know, I'm keen on China. I want to get into China. I want to invest in China on behalf of my clients. Am I looking at the next 12 to 18 months? Am I better off going into the China balance fund or am I better off going into the pure equity China fund? What, you know, what are the ups and downs of both of them, maybe? Sure. I think if you have a 10 plus year time horizon, so you say, okay, I'm in, I'm in with 10, 20 years, be equity, right? That's always the answer. That's very, very hard to be 100% equity. 10 or 20 year kind of time horizons. I think if, if you do care about risk, if you, you know, yeah, everyone likes to say we're a long term investor, but the reality is when things happen, you get nervous. Everyone gets nervous. And that's normal. And that's just being part of the investing. Um, so I think for the vast majority of the, of the people, I think the balance time is a really, really good solution. It's a good combination of risk return payoff on the thing. Vice versa, if you're maximizing, maximum return over 15, you don't even care about five years, you're a patient fund, you want to be 15, 20 years out, go 100% equities. So I think that would be the shortest um, answer to that. Thank you. Um, and then maybe if we can just talk out about your, your equity carver. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite similar to what the CSR 300 benchmark would be. Um, but, you know, obviously it's very actively managed. Can you just give us a brief overview of how that equity car bites looked after? Um, I think very, very simply, I think core to prescience philosophy is also that it's very, very simple. We know that 80 to 90% of active managers lose to the index over 10 in time horizon. It's as simple as that. So our starting point is that, number one, if you can get people that index, number two, you can minimize cost, and number three, in a market like China, where you can just give them, you know, 3% alpha, you know, consistently over the cycle, that would get you a top five percentile performer, or hopefully a top ten, top five percentile over a cycle, and that's exactly what we see. And that's what our product is. It's as simple as that. You know, it's not you know we're not a sexy fund. We don't try to be a hot buy, hard to start. It's going to get sixty percent growth annually. All of that. We have nothing to do with that. Market really efficient. It's hard to beat the index. They just beat the index consistently, and through that, we'll give you very good real returns. And through that, up from our, our competitive. And that's exactly what it's about. So we have actually have a fund. So it's an equity fund, and also not just a car buy, but the equity fund and the equity portion of the balance fund are exactly the same. Okay, and then maybe stemming from that, I mean, coming through again now, again focusing on the equity, does, it, does your process obviously mitigate risk as what it, uh, uh, a passive allocation would do? Um, obviously, you're mit trying to mitigate risk as much as possible in any form of asset management. Um, but, you know, maybe breach onto that a bit. Great question. Um, so I think that, uh, so, so crucially on that, is that what we try to do is to diversify it. So let me explain that. 
In, in our risk process, we identify about 24 different risk factors for the overall market. And they include everything in terms of commodities, in terms of interest rate risks, in terms of sector risks, uh, in terms of precious metals, in terms of exchange rates. Right? So these are the big components that we look at the 24 different risk factors in the market. And what we try to do is to give you stocks that on average are cheaper, are higher quality, are connected by behavioral model. And at the same time, because we, we want stuff that are cheaper, we want stuff that are higher quality, we want those things, you have to be different to the benchmark. And then we diversify the risk across our risk factors, more or less equally. And I think that's the key to our process, is that you have to take the risk, but what you don't want to do is to take the risk in one thing and bet on that one thing. No one can tell the future. We don't believe in forecasting the future. We do not believe anyone can do that. Anyone can take a punt. And if you're right, you become, you know, everyone says yes. Fantastic. You see, I think you're wrong, no one hears about you. That we don't believe in a good way to make money. So we still give you a cheaper, higher quality, behavioral model selected, diversify the risk across all of the Great. And then maybe just the, probably the last two questions for more of a geopolitical sort of stand. You know, with the tension rising in the China South and um, oh sorry, South China Sea with Taiwan. Um, does what sort of effect does it have on investments? Is that something to be cautious or worried about? Um, and then maybe secondly, stemming on this, obviously we've spoken a lot about US um, China relationships. Will there be a more of a shift to maybe a Europe China relationship going forward? Or, or, or is that obviously intact already? But I mean, could that be the new trade partner? Yeah, do you want to cover some of that? Yeah, so um, firstly on the on the Taiwan South China Sea, just to give a bit of background. Um, I think South uh, China's um, sort of what we've been reading in the news about sort of more Chinese military planes flying over uh, Taiwan's ADI, so, so air defense identification zone. It's actually a very wide area, including sort of uh, land on mainland China. So, so it's, it's very routine. Um, so a lot of the sort of supposed uh, news we see in the media, it's very routine actions. Uh, by the sort of mainland Chinese uh, PLA um, Air Force. Uh, what, what has changed recently, uh, more of a reaction from the mainland Chinese side is uh, sort of uh, increased, increased sort of uh, uh, actions from the Taiwanese government uh, to change the status quo. And uh, typically that's always expected. So when, uh, for example, when uh, on, the, on the 10th of October, when Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen uh, mentioned, uh, said in her speech, uh, very clear sort of uh, indications of uh, not one China, but two Chinas, uh, the People's Republic of China on the mainland and the Republic of China on Taiwan, that sort of crossed the red line uh, for China. And with, uh, with sort of consistent actions like that, we will expect to see uh, a lot of sort of increased military action. So what we've been seeing in the news is that previously where there were two planes flying to the uh, Taiwanese ADIZ uh, area, now there's 10 or 16 or 20, 30. So there's, there's more increased sort of military pressure from the mainland as a reaction uh, to sort of uh, what mainland China believes to be actions to change changing the status quo. And unfortunately, uh, this is very much political and well, we can't really point to sort of an exact cause. Uh, it could be a sort of America and Japan uh, also trying to put pressure on China uh, uh, with their ally Taiwan in the area. In terms of uh, the South China Sea, uh, it's also very much political. Obviously, China has a lot of military bases uh, there on, on sort of man-made man -made islands. Uh, we don't believe uh, military, direct military conflict uh, between the US and China uh, is something that's feasible or something that's wanted. Uh, at all uh, by both the US and China, because if you consider the relation between uh, mainland China and Taiwan and China and Japan, where there's disputes around uh, on islands around around China, uh, it all filters down to sort of the core of the issue is China-US relations, and uh, we we don't see that direct conflict as as anything uh, that's probable. And we, as I mentioned earlier, warming China China-US relations. Is great for humanity, uh, better for humanity as well, given uh, two nuclear powers. Um, but also uh, practically in the South China Sea, uh, with Chinese, uh, for example, the Chinese military's DF range of missiles, uh, there's not really uh, 
much military action that can uh, take place by any of the AUKUS alliance, uh, any of the aircraft carriers. So uh, many of the DF missiles uh, termed aircraft carrier killers, uh, as an example. So a lot of media noise again, uh, obviously with sort of tensions and military actions uh, being more frequent or military maneuvers being more frequent in the area, the risk of sort of a mistake happening or misunderstanding happening uh, is higher, the risk is higher, but uh, we uh, would, would consider that a very low risk because it is, it is such a, a sort of critical event that, ha that can happen if something goes wrong. So, um, you know, I mean, if there is direct military conflict, it would be uh, terrible for markets. Uh, we would expect sort of, depending on how the military conflict starts, different types of international reactions, which then can differently impact, impact markets. So, right, um, let me add yeah. to that a little bit. I think to, to also keep it a lot simpler, I think top level, there's one thing that's very, very easy, that if Taiwan declares independence, we're going to have it. And to be honest, that is the only path to war that we're currently on. So there's no other path to war. Uh, China's not going to do something that actually is actually impossible. So the only thing that's going to happen is if China, Taiwan declares independence, China's going to go to war. So that's why I don't worry too much about this, you know, kind of minor conflict thing. It's often is that China, Taiwan buying some weapons from America and China sending a signal saying stop buying weapons from America because if you do buy weapons, the scary thing about why buying weapons is dangerous is that as you go down the path, if you ever get to the point where Taiwan actually believes it can declare independence and, and be successful, then we are going to have it, right? So that is a crucial thing. I think that's really something like that. Said, other than that outcome, there's no such thing that's going to be war. That outcome is not popular in, China, in Taiwan itself. So even in Taiwan itself, they understand the vast majority of the population will not back that. And I think the only thing we're minorly worried about is that to win elections, certain parties make it say, you know, they like to do this independence thing. Um, and every now and then, China will kind of just remind Taiwan to stop buying the weapons, <laughs> stop pushing towards that outcome, which is a bad outcome. Uh, but I think overall, even President Xi Jinping's latest speech once again talked about peaceful reunification. There's no short term no path to war that we're both on. Um, and as you can mention, as, as relations, US loves to call shit. The US always loves to call shit and will do some weird stuff in, in and around. It's always very, very close to the Chinese coastline, they do some weird stuff. Uh, but as the relation warms up, then it's going, um, you know, that less, less shit will happen. And as such a conflict will just calm down, everything will just cool down again uh, a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, maybe just going on to Europe a little bit, I, I wouldn't say we we very um, we have a lot of knowledge on the situation, but I think it's quite clear that uh, the France and Germany, who sort of heads up sort of the European Union in terms of economy, uh, has expressed a view that they don't necessarily want to take the exact same approach as the US on seeing China as, as sort of a... Uh, uh, an, ad an adversary, so to say. Um, we see the China-European investment pact uh, still going through the process of being uh, written into law in, in the EU and being uh, sort of becoming fully effective. That allows uh, many EU businesses full access to China. We think that will be a major positive event uh, for China and the EU. Obviously, with Angela Merkel going out um, as German, German Chancellor, there might be some political uncertainty there, but we don't believe uh, the sort of trend of China and Europe uh, cooperation will, will change direction that quickly. Um, if we go back to the AUKUS, uh, we can see that obviously France record the, amb the ambassadors to, to the US and Australia over over the sort of stab at the back nuclear submarine deal uh, that Australia went into with the US uh, sort of ditching French supplies. So, so it's a lot of politics, uh, but I think where we should focus is where there's sort of common interest and where there's self-interest or national interest. And, and we believe that uh, Europe uh, as a whole uh, will likely not very obviously pick a side. And we, we feel, I mean, obviously, uh, for everyone's interest, it's best for Europe to be uh, working closely both with the US and China. And we expect that's probably the balance that they will be looking for going forward. 
avoid but less diplomatic. I mean, the US love going around more causing this. And the US does, uh, Europe just don't cause shit, right? If you don't cause shit, then China's always been, you know, we, China's never focused on the rest of the world. So it's easy to be friends. It's, it's that simple. And, uh, and America loves going around the world doing who knows what, spreading democracy with a whole trail of destruction, uh, you know, mass mayhem. Um, and that's a reality, right? They've been fighting a war for 100 years. A lot of time, I think, in China fought the war was in Korea. So, you know, it's as simple as that. Um, so I, I think look, culturally, Europe and America will always be closer together than Europe and China. Uh, but I just think that you know, just being neutral uh, goes a long way in terms of just having the reasonable expectations and, and cooperation. And cooperation is better for everyone. Uh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. And then uh, I know I said last question, but there's a few here that have come through that are almost on the same same theme and tune. Um, if we if we're just looking at allocating to China, you know, again, very difficult to think about. But it's a question we actually ask every quarter: is you know, what's the correct percent allocation? Obviously, we do a lot of work on you. You at MSCI China, China versus CSR 300, which we use as our benchmark for equity. We know there's differentiation between the two. Um, we know that if you were buying an MSCI World um, Index, you would probably be underweight China in context to the size of their market. Um, you know, so. What sort of correlations, sort of things do we need to look out for when allocating to China to try and get that, you know, what we deem as this perfect um, allocation to China to make sure that we're not lagging what we performance could come through from China and probably obviously not over allocating to someone like China? Uh, great question. So I think starting off with, uh, so if you just convert everything to one currency, you will see that both our China fund and the CSI 300 Asia benchmark will have the lowest correlation of the long term, or both short and medium and long term, to every other equity market in the world. So China is one of the best diversifiers you can add to your portfolio. So that's a starting point. The second thing is I'm also very realistic about people's allocation. Uh, so most people are not going to go you know, gun or huge into China. So I think from, from a very practical perspective, I think for us, I think if you allocate less than 5%, it's probably not making big enough impact on your portfolio. If you allocate more than 15, it's probably the right answer. So the right answer is probably closer to 20. But we also understand that no one's going to allocate 20 because um, you know, you're going to be out there by yourself allocating to China so much when no one else is ready and doing that yet. So I would guess the answer is always somewhere between 5 to 15 percent will make a, a material contribution to your return over the cycle. At the same time, not be too far off. You know, you're not out there by yourself with a huge allocation to China. I think that's a very, very good thing to see. And I think that's exactly what we see in our fund. So I think it's always very interesting. Take a look at our NAV in RAMS, right? So when we started the China fund, we always said, okay, and it's our last thing there, so it's one of the best I read. So take a look at our China balance fund NAV in RAMS, and what you will find is that volatility is actually low, and drawdown is actually low. Um, it's a great diversifier. And I think that's exactly um, what you so I'd say the practical answer is 5 to 15. The mathematical answer is much higher than that because it has one of the most uncorrelated markets compared to any other equity markets in the world. Great, thank you very much. And I think um, that's all we have for time for today. Um, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. And um, please, if you would like any more information on the China Fund or from the China team, please let us know. Right. Thank you. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Sorry, my signal just dropped for a few seconds there, guys. I understand there was also a bit of an issue with some sound today, and we'll make sure to rectify that for the next next time in the early of next year. Um, until um, Q4 report back in January, everyone keep well, keep safe, and thank you very much for your time once again. Thanks, everyone.